President, please be seated. Le président, veuillez vous asseoir. The court is now back in session, and the floor is given to the defense team for Mr. Nunchia to uh, present the arguments. Thank you again, Mr. President. As I mentioned before the break, I'll now be turning to the fourth and final CPK policy in this trial, the regulation of marriage and particularly the allegations of forced marriage and rape. Now, the co-prosecutors allege that the CPK, quote, sought to rapidly increase the population of Cambodia by arranging marriages of people without their consent, unquote. And what they say is that this was supposedly part of the CPK's broader policy to enslave the population. Mr. President, Your Honours, yes, the CPK had a policy regulating marriage and one encouraging population growth. However, far from requiring marriage between unwilling individuals and promoting rape, the official CPK policy was just like that of any other country. People could get married if they both consented and if the authorities approved. Similarly, people were encouraged to have children to ensure the country's growth. This was a normal demographic policy, which existed in most countries in the world at the time, and still occurs. But by portraying this normal regulation of marriage as a so-called breeding program, the co-prosecutors are here using drama and emotion to hide the fact that there is no evidence of a forced marriage policy. They're asking you, Mr. President and Your Honours, to rule that since the CPK encouraged people to have children, well then, they had to have had a policy to force people to marry, and that encouraged rape. However, this is a figment of the co-prosecutor's imagination. It's an attempt to demonize the CPK in blind loyalty once again to the Manichaean narrative. It ignores credible evidence and misrepresents the rest in a relentless attempt to secure a conviction. You cannot allow it. Mr. President, the question of forced marriage and rape within the context of marriage is a sensitive one. Marriage is an intimate matter. It touches on the questions of free will and consent, which are dear to most. It also touches on the institution of marriage, on which so many societies are based. It also touches, finally, on the concept of love one of our deepest, dearest emotions. It's also culturally sensitive. Talking about one's personal feelings and sexual relations is taboo in many places, including here in Cambodia. It's even more sensitive when it's discussed in as public a setting as this courtroom and with people from the opposite sex and from different cultures. At the end of the day, the charges of forced marriage and rape within forced marriage are particularly emotional. They strike close to home for many people. However, Mr. President, Your Honours, the question that Mr. this tribunal President, needs to answer is not whether the way marriages were regulated under DK was morally right or wrong. 
Si la façon dont les mariages étaient réglementés sur le contrat est démocratique, il était moralement acceptable ou non. La question n'est pas non plus de savoir ce que nous ressentons face à ces éléments de preuve. La question est de savoir s'il y a des preuves crédibles qui montrent que les crimes ont été commis, selon une policière CPK, conformément à une policière CPK, conformément à une policière CPK, conformément à une policière CPK, pour laquelle Nun Chia peut être tenu pour responsable. Et la réponse est non. Monsieur le Président, Your Honours, please resist the pressure of your emotions and that of others and look at the evidence in an objective and neutral way. Please ignore the lobbying that you're under from activists. Thanks to a flood of international funding on researching sexual violence, some activists tend to overemphasize isolated cases of what really constitutes forced marriage. But please remember that much of the research on so-called forced marriage is inherently flawed and biased. As you might know, the starting point of that research has often been to find victims of a forced marriage a souvent été de rechercher les victimes de représenter le spectre d'analyser de manière neutre un échantillon représentatif de la population cambodgienne pour apprécier ou analyser comment les mariages se déroulent dans le cadre de la pratique. Vous devez également ignorer la pression que le mariage doit se dérouler dans un certain cadre et dans certaines circonstances. Selon lequel les se dérouler d'une certaine façon et dans certaines circonstances are notions that have many nuances depending on the country and culture. Love marriage is a fundamentally Western concept which does not exist in most countries in the world. Indeed, what's important is to bear in mind how marriages took place both before and after the marriage. Mr. President, Your Honours, Peg Levine, who was one of the expert witnesses on marriage, she perfectly described the challenges that you judges have before you. She said, and I quote, how will the judges ensure a fair trial for those accused of forced marriages with so many double binds before them? These double binds or contradictions are created by emotions and political considerations. They have no place in a proper court. At the end of the day, this tribunal will not create a positive and lasting legacy for Cambodia and for the international community if you automatically convict Nunchia for forced marriage just because you feel pressure or fear being seen as insensitive if you don't. That positive legacy will be created by judges that act independently, impartially, and with integrity. Please follow the evidentiary principles now perfectly clarified by the Supreme Court Chamber. Your duty is to respect Nun Chia's presumption of innocence and to look at the evidence in a dispassionate and careful way. And what you'll see when you do so is that there is no evidence supporting the co-prosecutor's case. Aucun élément de preuve ne vient étayer la thèse du procureur. Now, Mr. President, to offer you a roadmap of my presentation, je vais vous présenter une I'll be beginning by discussing the regulation of marriage by first presenting the official CPK policy on marriage, which, as I've already mentioned, was based on consent. Qui, comme je dit, était basé sur le I'll then show you Ensuite, that the co-prosecutors' so-called breeding program is a desperate attempt to have your honours enter a conviction on the basis of speculation and bias rather than on actual evidence. And then, in the second part of our presentation, my colleague Liv Savannah and I will show that there was no such thing as a nationwide systematic practice of forced marriage from which you could find that an official forced marriage policy existed. To the contrary, we'll show that where evidence does point to crimes, those were 
isolated in in incidents rather than evidence of a nationwide policy. De tels crimes, alors so il then turning de first to this une question, question of policy, une the co-prosecutors allege that the CPK had an official forced marriage policy. However, not only do they fail to present sufficient evidence, they also ignore the two elephants in the room. And that is, first, that there is clear evidence that the CPK had a consent-based policy on marriage. And second, that both of the expert witnesses on marriage, Peg Levine and Kasumi Nakagawa, they both testified that there was no evidence of a nationwide policy on forced marriage. The reality is that the co-prosecutors were unable to point to even a single piece of evidence that the CPK had an official policy to forcibly marry people, as you can see in their brief. What the evidence actually shows is that there was indeed an official CPK policy regulating marriage. However, it was not a forced marriage policy, nor was it a breeding program. It was a legitimate policy requiring consent from both parties for a marriage to be valid, just like in any other country in the world. Mr. President, the CPK like every political institution, followed a set of principles. These were called the revolutionary principles, and they're described as, and I quote, the laws, the rules, the views, the stances, and the morality, unquote, of both the party and of the people. Everyone was to respect and follow them. Chacun devait les respecter Otherwise, the revolution would fail. Sinon, la révolution allait échouer. And as we've discussed at length in trial, Comme the sixth revolutionary mm, policy sets out the CPK's policy on marriage. Process, and it said that, quote, setting up a family, mariage, unquote, had to follow two concepts. And I'll quote concept. those for you. First, both parties agree. Second, the collective agrees, and then it is done." Notably, and as you also may recall, the sixth principle also strictly prohibited sexual violence. It in fact reads, quote, do not behave in any way that violates females, unquote. And on the 5th of August 1978, Pol Pot reiterated this principle, stating that marriages should occur on a voluntary basis. Mr. President, the policy could not be any clearer. Marriages had to be based on consent. Marriages had to be approved by the public authorities. No more and no less. And these two concepts, in fact, as I've already mentioned, reflect how marriage is regulated nearly everywhere in the world today. And in fact, they're the law that's applicable in Cambodia today. Now, conveniently, however, the co-prosecutors dismiss this clear policy. And what they claim is that it refers to the, I quote, power of the collective to take the final decision, whether the couple formally agrees or not. Now, Your Honours, we don't know how the co-prosecutors reached this speculative conclusion. The plain meaning of the policy is not only crystal clear, but is confirmed by a lot of evidence, including from multiple witnesses. And I will now give you a few examples. Tep Pop, who was on the Barre District Committee in the Central Zone, said that, quote, the marriage criteria were, firstly, the issue of age. The girls would have to be at least 18 years old. Secondly, both persons loved each other dearly. 
And thirdly, se chérir. The parents approved the marriage. Devait s'aimer. Et troisièmement, les parents John devaient approuver le mariage. Who was a West Zone Regiment commander, said to the East Zone. He testified that at a June 1978 meeting in Kampong Pol Pot encouraged the arrangement of marriages for people. But what exactly did Pol Pot say? That people should not be forced to marry. That arrangements for marriage should only be undertaken where the parties agreed. And then we have si Peck Chim, the former Tramcock District Pekchim Secretary in the Southwest Zone. Zone he also testified that before organizing a marriage, local authorities had to consult the couples and their parents. And the same principle also applied in the military. Sal Sarun, who was a committee member of Autonomous Sector 105, and then later the Autonomous Sector Secretary, he said that combatant wedding ceremonies were organized after asking if both the parents and the bride and groom approved of the marriage. Similarly, low-level cadres also confirmed that there was no forced marriage policy. You might recall Kum Bun, she was the chief of Cheng Tong commune in Trumpkot district. And what she said was that the practice was to consult couples and their parents in accordance with the district's instructions. Seng Ol was the chairperson of the women's unit in Neng Nang commune in Trumkok district, and she actually reported to the same Kum Bun. And what Seng Ol said was that she was the one directly in charge of marrying people, and that marriages were never directly coerced in her unit and that only if forcé, both parties agreed would they be married. Sous la dans son unité, et but unfortunately, si les deux and as you might recall, mariés, she was unable to testify because of health concerns. Vous des de santé. There are also other people who Tout testified that the instructions and practice was that marriages would only be arranged <laughs> if people agreed. We had Yu Van, the Rouen Commune Deputy Chief in Kampong Sing District, who confirmed this. So did Heng Lai Heng, a cadre in charge of the base and commune level in Kratia District in Sector 505. And she added that if there were a situation where people disagreed, quote, there would not be any serious problem. Je cite, il n'y aurait pas de problème grave. Fin de citation. Mr. President, even Doik, who, as you know, Doik, has shown a clear determination a to incriminate Nunchia wherever possible to shift the blame from himself. Even Doik testified that he was not aware of any policy of forced marriage. The bottom line is this. The evidence is overwhelming Alors, in showing that there was no official forced marriage policy. Mr. President, Your Honours, unlike the co-prosecutors, you cannot just ignore this. Contrairement à l'accusation, vous ne pouvez pas simplement l'ignorer. And now, turning to the question of population growth. Passons. The co-prosecutors also argue that part of the CPK's policy to enslave the population was their, quote, claim of ownership over the reproductive capacity of their slaves, unquote. So, as the co-prosecutors would have you believe, the CPK forced young people to get married and then forced those people to consummate their marriage all to satisfy the goal of population growth. Now, Mr. President, yes, the CPK did have a four-year plan to increase the population of Cambodia to 15 million in order to build, but also to protect the nation. But let's put this into perspective, however. Many countries encourage people to have children, particularly during or immediately after a period of war. This type of policy is called population control. 
And in 1974, 45% of countries in the world had policies aimed at influencing such population growth. Indeed, until 1999, countries such as France, Norway, Germany and Sweden had various measures in place to encourage people to have children. In fact, our very own United Nations itself has a population division and an expert group which analyzes, quote, policy responses to population aging and population decline, unquote. So then the question is, why do countries introduce such policies? Well, first, because there is a risk that fewer births will mean that there are not enough citizens to replace themselves and thus ensure the country's long-term survival. And second, these policies address general issues of population aging. Now, the CPK, if anything, had all the more reasons to encourage the growth of Cambodia's population. As we've discussed throughout our two-day presentation, Cambodia was just coming out of years of civil war, of poverty and dictatorship under Lon Nol, and was at war again with its bigger neighbor, Vietnam. So to put it plainly, to suggest that encouraging births within a population would amount to forcing people to marry is president simply ridiculous. Serait assimilable the co prosecutors sur la population. That, quote, studies have shown that this CPK population policy entailed forced marriage and forced pregnancy, unquote, in fact, falls far from establishing this link beyond reasonable doubt. And let's break this down a little. First of all, this argument only relies on Cet four publications by academics. And quite surprisingly, they rely on the expert witness Kasumi Nakagawa. And as Kasumi you will recall, Nakagawa. this ignores the fact that here in court, she testified ceci, en that there was fait, no evidence of a nationwide policy on forced marriage. Elle a qu'il n'y avait pas de preuve and then the remaining publications on which the co-prosecutors rely are, as I mentioned earlier, inherently biased, sont, uh, for they were premised on finding victims of sexual violence Car and not on analyzing the situation of marriage neutrally under the DK. La Just like the co-prosecutors, these publications, publications state that, that the CPK forced marriage through its population, through its population growth policy is based simply on speculation. These so-called researchers had reached their conclusions before even starting their research, blindly following the Manichaean narrative. Your Honour, the truth is that the only neutral study undertaken regarding Regarding the institution of marriage, under the DK, was that of the second expert, Peg Levine. And her study concluded that there was no link between population growth policy and forced marriage. And it concluded that there was no forced marriage policy. Again, we must stress it. What the co-prosecutors are trying to have you do, Mr. President and Your Honours, is to enter a conviction in the absence of credible evidence on the sole basis of wide speculation. This is unworthy of a court of law. Now, moving to my last point regarding the CPK's policy on marriage, I'll now discuss Nunchi's alleged role and contribution to the policy. And I'll be brief. There is no objective evidence. All that the co-prosecutors have is a quote allegedly attributed to Nunchi in Tetsamba's book. And in that quote, Nunchi has reported to have said that, and I quote, 
The man always wants to choose a beautiful girl. Que les hommes veulent so that's why we forced them to filles. get married. C'est pour cela and que Anka nous chose the wife. Et c'est l'Ankar qui choisit l'épouse. Fin de citation. This supposed quote, this is all the co-prosecutors have. Cette soi-disant citation, c'est tout And so, Mr. ce President, que possède l'accusation. What the co-prosecutors are asking you to decide is that just de, because de Nunchir may have said we forced them to get married. But this is enough to establish la seule de beyond reasonable doubt that Nunchir participated in and enforced a forced marriage policy. À la politique de mariage forcé et the answer to this, appliquer, we think, is obvious. La réponse, if this je crois, were all you évidente, needed, we wouldn't even have needed this trial. Si tout ce dont vous avez besoin, alors nous Mr. Pas President, the reality is that there is no recording of Nunchir saying this temps. to Tetsanbar. La he was not given the opportunity to review the book Nunchir before its publication. Ses à the Bad. authors of the book said that they would Quote, tell the story in the way they thought it should be told, unquote. Even the expert Peg Levine, when confronted with this quote in court, expressed serious concerns about its representativeness and its accuracy. The list can go on, Mr. President, but I think the point is made. This quote, even if it were something that Nunchir <coughs> said, Je crois que cela proves a absolutely nothing. Que cette and it certainly does not rien. outweigh the overwhelming si evidence showing that there was no such thing as a forced marriage policy, Et and that instead, pas marriage was based on consent. Qui Il avait pas une telle now, de the co-prosecutors need to establish beyond reasonable doubt that forced marriage, marriage occurred in a systematic way throughout the decade. Été... This is the only way that they can show de that there was a systematic pattern of conduct from which we can identify the existence of a nationwide policy. As I'll discuss next, however, and so will Liv Savannah, the evidence precludes such a finding. I'll first explain that there is no such thing as a systematic practice where people were forced to marry. The Savannah will then discuss the allegations of monitoring. He will show that while there may have been isolated incidents, they were the result of rogue elements rather than the expression of an official nationwide policy et non l'expression d'une politique nationale officielle. So let's now look at those facts. Prenons à présent ces faits. The prosecutors argue, and I quote, that the scale of the number of forced marriage and the similarity in patterns established that forced marriage and forced consummation que les mariages forcés et la consommation CPK forcée des mariages faisaient partie d'une politique centrale du PCK. Fin de citation. However, Your Honours, Toutefois, this is simply ce n'est tout simplement true. pas exact. The evidence presented by the co-prosecutors is just a selection, which they label as the presentation. Les preuves présentées par l'accusation sont une simple sélection considérée par l'accusation comme représentative. L'accusation, toutefois, ignore toutes les preuves, ne cadrant pas including avec the conclusions la théorie of the two expert witnesses who testified at length in this trial. De deux témoins experts qui ont abondamment été entendus à la barre. The co-prosecutors allege that the CPK's, quote, frequent use of violence and demand for blind obedience created a general atmosphere of terror and coercion exigée, where une atmosphère générale de terre et de contrainte et que dans l'ensemble Unquote. Un consentement individuel authentique again, however, à se marier n'était pas possible. Encore une fois, l'accusation n'offre pas de preuves crédibles à l'appui de cette affirmation. Elle ignore aussi le grand nombre de témoins et parties civiles qui ont dit que les gens n'avaient pas été forcés à se marier so sous le camp de démocratique. L'accusation se réfère à une poignée de témoignages. They rely, en outre, once again, une fois de plus, elle s'appuie largement sur des procès verbaux d'audition et sur des livres qui, pour la plupart, renvoient à des rumeurs et des suppositions infondées. L'accusation déforme aussi la preuve. Un exemple. 
The co-prosecutors allege that one civil party, party civil, Hong Yun, said that she consummated her marriage, even though she did not want to, because she was afraid since her cousin, Heng Vani, was killed for having refused to marry someone. Avait été tué pour avoir refusé However, de se marier. Toutefois, quand elle a été contre-interrogée, Um Yuen explained um that Yuen all she knew was that her cousin was killed. Savait, she que provided son, no sa cousine link avait between tué. that death and her cousin's alleged refusal to marry.